Investing in an index fund is one of the best investment moves you can make. Index funds have low fees, they're tax efficient, they tend to generate good returns over time, and most importantly, they provide diversification, or at least they're supposed to. Historically, index funds have outperformed actively managed funds, and this is mostly due to their lower fees. Many of the big stock indices, like the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq, are not nearly as diversified as they used to be, and this is a growing problem. There are two main uses for a stock market index, benchmarking and investment. Initially, stock market indices existed to inform investors of how well the overall stock market was doing, and this was their main purpose for a very long time. Stock market indices were already 87 years old in 1971 when BGI launched the first index fund, followed by Vanguard a few years later in 1975. Index funds, which were at first ridiculed and called un-American for setting mediocrity as a goal, now control 20 to 30 percent of the American equities market, if not more. The function of a stock index today is more to provide a list of stocks for index funds to invest in than to inform investors of how the overall market is doing. The S&P 500, the index that most investors pay attention to, is off to a great start this year. It's up around 19% year to date, and while that's great, the returns of the index have mostly been driven by seven of the largest US tech companies, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Nvidia, Tesla, and Meta. You know, Facebook. These stocks are up between 35% and 210% year to date. The remaining 496 companies are in aggregate about flat. Technology companies make up 28.1% of the S&P 500, and for those who consider Tesla a technology company rather than an automaker as S&P classify it, technology is then 29.9% of the overall index by weight. The top five stocks in the S&P 500, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Nvidia, and Alphabet, or Google, represent nearly a quarter of the market cap of the entire index. The top five stocks in the S&P at the peak of the dot-com mania in 1999 only made up 16% of the index back then, which was not much higher than the historical average. The frothiest stocks at the time were not actually S&P constituents. Apple, with its $3 trillion market cap, is alone worth more than the entire Russell 2000 index of smaller American companies combined, or more than the UK's top 100 listed companies combined. It has a weighting of 7.6% in the S&P 500. The tech sector has been heavily weighted in the S&P for some time now. It first hit 25% of the index back in February 2018 and has continued upward since then. That breakthrough in 2018 was the first time the sector made up at least a quarter of the S&P since the dot-com bubble. In 1999, the tech weighting of the S&P only got above 25% for the final four months of the dot-com bubble, when share prices, particularly in the tech sector, were going nuts. To be clear, the problem with the dot-com era was that stock valuations had exploded beyond reason, not that the market was too concentrated. Concentration was not the issue, valuation was. So is valuation a problem today? Well, the forward P.E. ratio for the technology sector stands at a little over 27 right now, compared with a peak of 60 in March 2000. This implies that valuations in the tech sector, while quite high, are considerably less stretched than during the dot-com bubble, and that the sector's heavy index weighting is more justified by fundamentals today than it was back then. There is growth in this sector too. Half of the expected S&P 500 earnings growth in the fourth quarter of 2023 
is expected to come from just four companies, according to FactSet. In its recent Earnings Insight report, FactSet found that four percentage points of the 8.2% expected fourth quarter index earnings growth comes from Meta, NVIDIA, Alphabet, and Amazon. Without these stocks, S&P earnings growth in the final quarter of the year is estimated to be 4.2%. So if the S&P is concentrated, what about the Nasdaq? The Nasdaq 100 wasn't specifically set up to be a tech index. It's just an index made up of 101 equity securities issued by 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the Nasdaq Stock Exchange. And while people think of it as a tech index, it's actually just 57% tech stocks, or just over 60% if you count Tesla as a tech company. Individual company weightings are even more concentrated on the Nasdaq. As of yesterday, Apple made up 11.7% of the index, Microsoft was 9.4%, Amazon 5%, and so on. This became a real problem for Nasdaq last month. But before I dig into that, let me tell you quickly about today's video sponsor, Surfshark. I've been using VPN software like Surfshark for quite some time. Surfshark is an easy to use and affordable VPN app for Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, and more. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and what it means is that when you use it, all of your internet traffic goes through a secure tunnel, and your data is encrypted, making it much safer when you access the internet from a coffee shop or an airport lounge. A VPN can help improve your privacy, make it harder to be tracked online, and bypass censorship. Surfshark is not just a great way to protect your data, but you'll also find that if you log into streaming services from different countries, different content is available. With Surfshark, no matter where in the world you are, you get to take the internet from home with you. Surfshark is fast, reliable, and they don't collect or track your data. Get an exclusive Surfshark deal. Enter promo code BOIL for an extra three months free at surfshark.deals forward slash BOIL. Click the link in the description to sign up today. The way most indices like the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq 100 are constructed is that each company is weighted based on its market value. So bigger companies matter more than the smaller, less valuable companies do. As companies' market values change over time, their weighting in the index goes up or down. This means that the index is always representative of the overall growth of the companies that meet the index inclusion criteria. In 1990, IBM was the leading global company and Apple was a tiny upstart. So IBM was the heaviest weighted stock in the S&P 500 and Apple ranked 107th on the list. Now that Apple is more economically relevant than IBM, the two companies' index ranks have changed. Apple is now number one and IBM is around 60. Index investors didn't have to buy or sell any shares to adjust for this change, and they didn't get hit by any capital gains taxes either. The weightings adjusted as one company that they owned outperformed another company that they also owned. The investors at any point in time between those two dates owned a basket of stocks that was representative of big business in the United States at that point in time. These indices work just fine as a measure of how American companies are doing overall. But with Apple being weighted at almost 12% in the Nasdaq and over 7.5% in the S&P, they're not looking like great diversifiers. You might think that it doesn't matter, but index funds are mutual funds, and there are SEC and IRS rules that encourage mutual funds to diversify their holdings if they want to be classified as a diversified fund. Under those rules, diversification roughly means having at least half of a fund's assets in companies that each make up less than 5% of its portfolio. Early last month, Six companies, Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet, NVIDIA, Amazon, and Tesla, so their combined weight reached 50.9% of the index. This meant that something had to be done. 
NASDAQ needed to change the way the index was calculated because its customers have regulatory diversification requirements and the main business of an index provider is not to provide interesting information to news organizations. It's to come up with an investable portfolio so that it can charge a fee to asset management firms who track the index. As a result of the growing concentration in the NASDAQ 100, NASDAQ announced a special rebalance, the first that they've ever done, which took place on July 24th to redistribute the weight of the index's members. This could happen again if the biggest stocks continue to outperform their smaller peers. The fact that a few companies are driving most of the returns of US indices is not really anything new. There are always hot stocks that pull away from the pack. In the 1960s, it was the Nifty 50 with stocks like IBM, Kodak and Xerox. We saw a similar situation with the oil companies in the past, and today the mega cap tech stocks are enjoying their time in the spotlight. This year, generative AI has fueled a powerful stock market rally, helping to pull the entire US stock market higher, and a simple explanation for some of the extreme concentration that we're seeing is that a small number of companies are making a lot more money than most of the others are. These companies also happen to be at the forefront of technologies like AI. Now, this doesn't explain everything. There is plenty of hype in there too, but this is not the same as the dot-com bubble where unprofitable companies became extremely valuable for a short period of time. There's a very high correlation around 0.8 between the earnings being generated by companies and their weights in the index. Cathy Wood's ARK Innovation Fund, which mostly invests in unprofitable companies, is not rising in line with the NASDAQ. Christopher Bloomstrand on eggs.com, or Twitter, points out that the NASDAQ 100 is back to being only 5% below its all-time high, while the ARK Innovation Fund remains 68% below its 2021 top, because profits and price do seem to matter. 82% of ARK's capital is in profitless enterprises, while 99.5% of the NASDAQ 100 weight is in profit-generating companies. If you were to weight the S&P 500 by net income rather than by market cap, you would find similar overall weightings to what we're seeing today. A few of the names would exchange places and there would be less concentration in the top holdings, but nothing too dramatic. There is froth, but it's maybe less extreme than you might imagine. The excitement around generative AI has obviously been the big tech story of 2023 so far, and this has been a big driver of a lot of the performance that we've seen in tech stocks this year. Growing interest in ESG investing has also driven investment into the tech sector at the expense of out-of-favor sectors like oil and gas. If you're going to rank companies by how much CO2 they produce, advertising and software companies are going to do well in such a ranking. The growth of the US tech sector is not just ESG and AI hype. A big part of the growth is driven by the US's global leadership in consumer-facing technology, which has brought about this cluster of highly profitable and durable companies. Second quarter earnings from these companies have been beating expectations so far, but in their earnings calls, they have not been prepared to predict when new AI features will show up in their products and services or what they hope to eventually charge for the technology. Amy Hood, Microsoft CFO, told investors on an earnings call last week that the revenue impact would be gradual as the features are launched and start to catch on with customers. Somewhat surprisingly for a group of companies that are heavily growth focused, cost discipline has contributed to the earnings outperformance this year. Many of these firms have cut headcount, some quite dramatically in the last 12 months, while continuing to grow. There might still be some signs of overvaluation though. 
Scott McNeely was the CEO of Sun Microsystems, one of the hottest tech stocks of the late 1990s. At its peak, the stock was trading at 10 times revenues. A few years after the bubble had burst, he had this to say about the stock's valuation. At 10 times revenues, to give you a 10-year payback, I have to pay you 100% of revenues for 10 straight years in dividends. That assumes I have zero cost of goods sold, which is very hard for a computer company. That assumes zero expenses, which is really hard with 39,000 employees. That assumes I pay no taxes, which is very hard. And that assumes that you pay no taxes on your dividends, which is kind of illegal. And that assumes that with zero R&D for the next 10 years, I can maintain the current revenue run rate. Now, thinking through that, would any of you like to buy my stock at $64 per share? Do you realize how ridiculous those basic assumptions are? You don't need any transparency. You don't need any footnotes. What were you thinking? It's hard to disagree with the point he makes on excessive investor optimism. But right now, Tesla, a manufacturing company, is trading at around 10 times revenues just like Sun Microsystems was. And NVIDIA is trading at around 44 times revenues, a lot more. NVIDIA riding the wave of AI investor enthusiasm and scrapping its original revenue guidance for the coming quarters in favor of more bullish predictions has gained $640 billion in market cap just this year alone. That's more than the entire value of Visa, but less than the value of Berkshire Hathaway. All of that value has been gained in seven months. By any measure, the concentration that we're seeing in stock indexes, driven by stock performance, has reached an extreme. The run-up of a handful of stocks is masking a lack of performance from the vast majority of both US and global stocks and is complicating investment decisions both for stock pickers and index investors. Stock pickers who've attempted to stay diversified will have underperformed the index as they won't have owned enough of the top performers. And as we've seen with the Nasdaq example, index providers have been struggling to keep their indices investable. This has led many market commentators to warn that we're in a bubble and that difficult times lie ahead. This year, MSCI's index of global value stocks has fallen about 12%. And the FT is reporting that value investing, the strategy of buying cheap stocks in often unfashionable industries, is suffering its worst run in 200 years. This extreme level of stock performance concentration can resolve itself in one of three ways. Things can continue on getting more and more concentrated. The rest of the market can catch up with the leaders or today's hot stocks can fall back by underperforming in the future. Is there a market signal in the data, you might ask? Well, Max Kettner at HSBC wrote in a note to clients that increased performance concentration in itself does not throw off a strong reliable trading signal. If anything, at the margins, concentrated performance may even be positive. He says that the immediate market performance following weak market breadth is better compared to when equity market breadth is strong. Vic Niederhofer in his book Practical Speculation found that the relative rankings of index sectors show negative correlation between years, meaning that the best performing sectors of one year are often the worst performing sectors of the next year and vice versa. The takeaway is possibly that investors should plot a steady course and avoid chasing market trends or getting too carried away with the hype stocks of any given moment. The S&P 500 Equal Weight Index weighs S&P 500 companies equally rather than by market value. And investors who are concerned about the lack of diversification in a market cap weighted index might consider investing in it. When you look at the long-term returns of this index, it has outperformed the market cap weighted S&P slightly, but with greater volatility. 
the equal weighted index has been 10% more volatile than the regular S&P 500 since 1990. Most of its long run outperformance occurred during the bursting of the dot com bubble in 2000 and again in 2009 in the wake of the credit crunch. It's worth noting that an investor in an equal weighted index like this will be paying more in taxes as the index is constantly selling stocks as they rise and buying other stocks as they fall. So it's less tax efficient than the market cap weighted index. Depending on your tax rate, any outperformance may be entirely wiped out by the taxes you have to pay each year. Hopefully you found today's video interesting. If so, you should watch this one next. Don't forget to check out our video sponsor Surfshark VPN using the link in the description below. Have a great day and see you in the next video. Bye.